Oh, there's I, I can't give away all the secrets. You have to invite <laughs> me back for the next podcast. But <laughs> yes, we we have secured the venue for the Thursday evening gala event. Our MC has also just been confirmed. So we will actually be announcing a few of those things shortly. But I'm under embargo from announcing them announcing them today. Otherwise, I'll get I'll get into trouble. But Hi, I'm Dirk Mulder, founder of the Koala News. I'm coming to you from Wajuk Noongar country in Perth, WA. And g'day, I'm Rob Maliki from the Global Society, coming to you from Garrigal Land in Sydney. And Dirk, a couple of years ago, David Lloyd, Vice Chancellor of UniSA, made a very funny but probably accurate <laughs> comment. Astute even. Astute is exactly the word I was looking for, <laughs> about what we would call a collective noun for a group of vice chancellors. And his view was that a collective group of vice chancellors should be called an argument of vice chancellors, <laughs> which I think drew laughs at the time. But there's an issue going on right now that seems to have done a pretty good job of unifying quite a few vice chancellors. What's going on? It sure is. Look, the, the visa mess, I guess, continues to roll on. And, and I, it's now, I guess, turning into a mess. Over the last few weeks, as most people in the sector know, the government in their endeavours to bring down net overseas migration, are really cracking down on student visas. And and some of that has been opaque and lacked transparency. So there's a lot of frustration around. What's happened is 16 vice chancellors in an argument got together and they've petitioned, I guess, the Australian government around some of the work that's happening in this space. And, and they've calculated that across their 16 institutions, there's about a $310 million loss on the cards due to due to some of this stuff that's going on in the visa area. So it's, you know, when VCs get together and, and do these things, they don't do them regularly. So when, when, when these things happen, I think people sit up and take notice. And certainly, you know, they had a, a meeting with Minister O'Neill and Minister Clare just recently, certainly on the, on the table, mate. It's 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 gathering momentum, that's for sure. And the Minister, Claire O'Neill, Minister for Home Affairs, came out as this story was breaking and Koala News was first to, to, to break this and then it was picked up by the mainstream. Mm. Then uh, Claire O'Neill was, was pretty quick out onto X, formerly Twitter, basically tweeting around how this was part of the government's plan, but part of a plan that they, they perhaps never decided to tell the sector about. <laughs> yeah, and look, I you know, we've got Alec Vinici on later, so it'll be interesting to see his viewpoint. But yeah, look, you're right. I mean, I, look, you, you go back and you could probably see that, that the government you know, was certainly wanting to decrease net migration. I think it's the way in which it's gone about. So, you know, the point that I would make is around, you know, if you're a student sitting around and, and, you know, we've talked about this in previous podcasts, you know, particularly after I received that letter from the Pakistani student, you know, there's just a lot of uncertainty around length of of visa timeframes. So, you know, the student that we were talking about, I think two, two podcasts ago, waiting five months for a visa outcome, you know, is that good enough? Yeah, I don't know. Rejections that are coming through the system. And I think there was an example there where there were twin sisters, one got a visa, one didn't get a visa. So it, it's those kind of things that I think are really leading to uncertainty, to frustration and, and to that lack of transparency, which, you know, quite frankly, isn't or has never been what Australia has been about. We've always been very forthright and very open about if you meet these things, you this is this will be the outcome. And that seems to have changed recently. So, you know, let's hope that we can get back onto sure footing and, and see how that goes. It's interesting looking back at my YouTube channel, Choosing Your Uni, the Choosing Your Uni YouTube channel. I get a lot of comments on there, a lot of questions from international students from all over the world. And after you broke the news about this visa slowdown, I went back and looked through the comments getting there. And it actually kind of correlates that around about the same time, suddenly I started getting this like flood of people just asking questions saying, what's the visa processing timeline at the moment? Of course, that's something I have absolutely no no idea about. Hmm. But it's interesting to go back and to see that already late last year, this was starting to be felt by students. And I, I completely agree that we've got this issue that this is human lives that we're mm -hmm. dealing with here. You've got people, and we, you mentioned this last time we are on the news, that we, you've got people that are that are waiting and are putting their lives on hold, mm. even after they've had an Australian institution that's done the hard work of mm. verifying that they're a genuine temporary entrant mm. candidate, they've done all the work and then it's being handed off to, to government who really should just be rubber stamping a visa and boom, like we're now in this sort of situation. So this to me is a, a big issue is once you start impacting real humans and their lives, mm. that's not just a short-term problem, but it's a problem where potentially we lose goodwill from students, families, 
agents, yep. educational institutions for a yep. long period of time. Yeah, well, it's, it's brand Australia, right? And it's not as shiny as what it was six months ago. That's for sure. Can I pick up on a point that you just mentioned? Institutions doing the hard work. And that's one of the things that I think in the last week, I've found really fascinating. So, you know, we've seen COEs being withdrawn from institutions based upon migration outcomes, not based upon education or anything like that. And just this morning, last night, I was contacted by a source. And just this morning, I, I published a story that spoke about institutions now not accepting applications from onshore students who may be on another temporary visa. We're now seeing the next iteration of of what institutions are doing to protect themselves in this changing visa situation. To give clarity, there's probably three visas here that are that are really being covered. So one is, and please excuse me if I get these that the numbers wrong. I want to say it's the 408, which is the COVID event visa. My understanding is that immigration has spoken to a number of institutions and and said that they're going to be very critically looking at applications that come from people who are already on temporary visas locally. So so one COVID event visa. Two will be the 485, which is the the graduate, the temporary graduate visa, which is, you know, that visa that allows students to work after they've studied here. And the last is a is a tourist visa. It's interesting because I was talking to my wife earlier and, you know, if a student comes here for a holiday or, you know, to see family or to do something like that, and they think, you know, this is a pretty good place. I wouldn't mind studying here. It now seems that that is increasingly unlikely that they would obtain a visa if they're already here on some sort of other temporary visa. So again, when we when we think about tracks to study, those tracks are now starting to to dwindle and they're starting to be cut off. It will be really interesting to see what happens over the next week or two after this sort of breaks through and gets into public discourse or, or, where, or whether it does at all. But certainly institutions now are looking at their standing within the SSVF program. They're looking at what their immigration assessment level is as an institution, and they're putting in policies to, to protect themselves against dropping down in that system, because ultimately that will impact their ability to recruit international students into the future. There's a lot of change going on at the moment, and unfortunately, it's the poor old student that, that suffers because of well, we'll talk a little bit more about that with Alec Vaninsky a little bit later in the podcast, but change of left-hand turn, change of direction, things hotting up, actually quite quite literally in your part of the world. It's been cooking over in Perth for the last week, hasn't it? Oh my God. I don't mind saying I actually volunteered at my kid's primary school on Monday to time, be a timekeeper at their, at their time trials. It was 41 degrees. And I've got to say, standing on the edge of that pool, timing, you know, eight, nine, 10 year olds swimming was, I've got to say, it was hard jacker. Still very good to do, but it was hard jacker in 41 degrees. You would have been tempted just to throw yourself in there, <laughs> get amongst it. Uh, a little That's change it. of pace though. So as you know, API coming up very, very quickly over in over in Perth? Yeah, absolutely. So we had Louise Kennard, who's the Executive Director of API, based out of Melbourne on the podcast last time. Yeah, mate, we're not far away. I think we're two weeks away from, from API. It'd be great. I think we're going to be getting close to 2,000 people rocking into Perth for that. Big program again, and really looking forward to it. I think the people that I'm talking to in Perth are really looking forward to being able to show off the city, particularly those who are members of local institutions as staff, being able to have people on their campuses and being able to show off what Perth has to offer. Fingers crossed, it's not 41 degrees and something a little bit more manageable but and we live in hope mate we live in hope it's funny there's not much breathing space for for universities right now i was just on campus down in melbourne a couple of institutions Mm. for the orientation periods doing a bit of (laughs) filming for the choosing your uni youtube channel things are pumping out there and then you've suddenly got the international conference scene is already heating up as well it just feels like there's there's no rest for the wicked isn't it like this year is now on i always say orientation graduations are the two best times a year and it's just i remember being you know in, in in an institution myself and being able to actually play an active role in orientation and see the aspiration and the hope and the excitement of new international students on campus it's a feeling that you just can't buy it's fantastic shall we sort of stick on the global theme, global conference, global issues, interesting stuff going on in, in Canada right now. They've had a few issues, haven't they? You've been you've been reporting on this over the last couple of months almost. Yeah. So Earl Blaney who and Justin Coleman, who are both based in Canada, have been really, really wonderful with their time and being able to contribute to the Koala and, and be able to provide some on-ground insights, the latest of which was last week. So CAPS, as we know, have been signaled by the by the Federal Minister Mark Miller over in Canada. They're now coming down to the point where cap allocations are starting to be talked about and and set. And it's going to be winners and losers across the provinces. So 
CSI Ontario, um, which obviously is is one of the the largest provinces, is expected to take the brunt of the hit. Apply Board, one of the major aggregators, there is forecasting a drop to two thousand two hundred thirty six thousand three seventy three approved applications, and that's down one hundred thirty three thousand from twenty twenty three. So some big moves there in Ontario in terms of cutting that down. At the other end of the spectrum, though, Alberta's expected to gain more than thirty six thousand allocations, and that's followed by Quebec with twenty nine. While Nova Scotia, British Columbia, and New Brunswick are expected to decline slightly, and remaining provinces predicted to gain or essentially remain the same. So, you know, if you're in Ontario, Toronto, that area of the world, it's going to be some hard times as we're experiencing here in Australia. If you're in Alberta, happy days. Things are things are looking okay. So the argument of vice chancellors in Ontario are going to be uh, <laughs> very much aligned, I think. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. How about we shift across the Atlantic? <laughs> yeah. How about we shift across the North Atlantic and let us know what's going on in, in, in the Netherlands? Yeah. So the Netherlands, they have just undertaken a, an election. A far right, my understanding is a far right allocation of, of parties has one power there. Generally, the way that the wind's blowing, as far as I know, is that the Netherlands is has boomed in terms of international students. We've seen over the last two years accommodation issues and being able to house students have been an issue with different institutions actually talking to their students about if you haven't secured accommodation, you might be wise to uh, potentially defer. That's probably gone now to the next level where the Dutch are now talking about reducing the amount of English language program and reducing the demand in that sense and promoting Dutch language programs. So we're seeing a shift in policy there as well. It will be interesting to see over the next sort of couple of months as to how far that policy beds itself or whether the, the Diet Coke of policy, that's certainly coming up in the Netherlands' view. So we'll, 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 we'll keep an eye on that for everyone and, and report in as it, as it occurs. Just a broader thought, you know, around the sort of nationalistic movements around the world. It just feels like it's getting a bit of momentum, doesn't it? It's mm, a sure bit, does. A little bit sure worrisome. Does. I mean, at least at least very prominent in the dialogue. I mean, who knows what's going to happen in the US later this year with, with the election there. But certainly mm. the rhetoric has shifted dramatically. And I think now more than ever, this is why international education is so important. You know, that nationalist rhetoric starts to ramp up. We've got to keep those flows of humans and communication and values going. Yeah, I feel like we're in a good place contributing positively. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's it's a, you know, when you take a step back and you look at the kind of the macro levels, migration, I think we we would all argue that intercultural engagement is a really positive thing. Certainly from a Dutch perspective at this point in time, there there probably comes a point at what at what point does migration and intercultural engagement take away from what the core and again, national feeling. I don't want to say national because that sounds maybe a little bit right wing. But if you've got a solid culture in a country that's a, that's a certain way, at what point does that potentially be diluted or, or does that get traded off around intercultural engagement? And it's a fascinating conversation because you know, there, there's two sides to that argument that are you know, possibly equally as valid. But at what point do does government intervene in that? And that's that's I think what we're going to start seeing out of the Netherlands is is intervention based upon you know a cultural sense of identity, history, and all of those types of things. So it'll, it's a, it's fascinating, mate. And I, it won't be the last country that goes through this. And as you say, there's there's threads of that now moving right across the world. So fascinating. So coming back to Australia then, Dirk, the English language barometer is underway or coming coming up, I think. Right? Yeah, it sure is. So. Or, it's coming up. Yeah. So English Australia last week announced that the English language barometer will go ahead this year. It's going to be conducted from May through to August. And Rob, I, I've got to tell you, very similar, I guess, to the international student barometer, which is generally uh, conducted through universities. Such a valuable tool for institutions to participate in. Um, I remember probably the first, well, I was part, I was around when the first one was done, but certainly the first three were really interesting to me. Um, being able to go and talk to international students about what their experience is, then having that data at your own institution, being able to benchmark that against identified groups, so whether that's the entire sector participating, whether that's a smaller group such as the ATN or the IRU network or, or like-minded institutions, really gives you a sense for where your institution or where your college sits on student engagement 
vis-a-vis others. For instance, I, I remember you know, we spoke about our orientation and our orientation was was one of, well, this was when I was at Murdoch, our orientation was one of the real highlights. Our accommodation was really strong, but there were areas, say, in terms of, say, you know, I think we, were, we weren't necessarily the first one to have broad, broad Wi-Fi across the institution where others did, and that that really pinged up in our results. So a fascinating tool, highly recommended for English language colleges only and being run from May through August. So I highly recommend anyone in the English language space jumping on board with this. Again, just fascinating insights to how to improve your own business model, how to improve services for students and how to ensure that students are getting a best in class experience at your institution. A little bit of a piece of news that I'd, I'd missed out on was the appointment of Ian Aird as the new CEO of English Australia after mm. Brett Blacker moved across to, to Duolingo. So Ian's got 25 years of experience in international education. He's got lots of board experience as well, not only on the English Australia board, but also on the Study New South Wales board. And he's been chair of other organisations as well. So that's a very, a very nice move by English Australia yeah. to bring in fresh blood although it's experienced fresh blood. <laughs> and you know what? He's just a, he's a, he's a good bloke too. So he's, it's going to be really good to see him take that organisation forward over the next few years. It's going to be brilliant. In a few moments, we'll bring in our guests, but maybe to shift us over towards it, some news from IDP, some stats and figures out. Yeah, I look at just top line figures. So IDP released its first half 2024 financials. Look, top line is that that fifteen that revenue is up 15%. So that's really great for IDP. Will be interesting to see as we move through this visa situation. I'm sure Alec will, will have some views on that, but yeah, you know, certainly a strong IDP is, is good for the industry, and we'll see how that that moves out. But yeah, look, really, really strong figures out of IDP for first half 2024. Just a quick aside: Global Horizons is brought to you by the Global Society, Australia's learning abroad support company. If you're looking to upskill your team, bring in a little bit more support or technology to help make your learning abroad more effective. Yeah then get in touch with us, globalsociety.com.au. So, Rob, shall we bring in our guest? Yeah, let's do it. Today's guest on Global Horizons is Alex Vaninsky, who's the Head of External Relations at IDP Connect, but very well-known figure in Australian international education. He's been a consultant. He's worked at UNSW and done so much else besides, and consistently, Alec, the very best dressed person at the AIC oh, annual shucks. dinner. Go on, go hey, on. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. Thanks, Rob. Thanks. thanks. It's, the, it's the bow ties that I love, I've got to say. Whenever I'm looking at... It is the bow ties, which I did not wear, which I, did, I didn't wear today, but I'll, I, will, I will break them out for AIC, don't you worry. I, I love that. I look across that conference floor and I, I know where Alec is because I see the bow tie. Very good. Lots, lots to discuss as we've been talking, Dirk. Like it's been a bumpy couple of weeks around the visa situation. So, Alec, you've been at IDP now for about four or five months. How's the how's the transition going? Uh, yeah, it's great. It, it, it's been it's been really good. I mean, unfortunately, I knew quite a few people in the IDP Connect team already, so it's, which makes the transition a little bit easier. But uh, it's great because we've been with external relations. We're pulling in some disparate strands from media and communications events and AIEC research and thought leadership together and into one sort of unit or one division, which is great because there's a lot of interconnectivity there. So it's a it's a new role, it's a new unit or new division. Um, and it's just exciting to, to, to be part of something bigger. Obviously, you know, it's previously with Edified, but I, I do miss the, the Edified team, the, the consulting team there. But this is a IDP does some 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 fantastic work in terms of representing Australia and other, you know, major destination markets. So I'm really excited to be part of something something bigger. Yeah, I think big is big is the key word, isn't it? I mean, I remember back when I was kind of traipsing the, the boards back in India and, and those other places, IDP was a student recruiter and that was pretty much it. It probably, you know, IELTS testing made up a little bit of its income. Now that seems to have grown, but it just seems like IDP just has its finger in so many pies at the moment. So it must be a fascinating time to join the organisation as it's looking you know, increasingly globally, but also increasingly across product lines. It's just, it's such a massive undertaking. Absolutely. I mean, we grew by, I think we, we opened another sort of dozen offices, physical offices last year. And I know I've only been with IDP, so it's certainly not the Alec effect. But if we look at the first first half of the financial year, you know, IDP just had a, an absolute ripper of a year for student placement. 
33% growth for Australia. I think about 57, 58,000 students placed worldwide just in the last six months. So things are, things are going, going really well. I mean, there are storm clouds ahead, as I'm sure we'll talk about later in terms of some of the policy issues happening around the world. But it's great to see that post pandemic, the fundamentals are really strong and, and Australia remains a, a really a, a destination of choice for students and parents around the world. Yeah, let's hope so. It's certainly one of the things that Rob and I've been talking about the last few podcasts around that destination of choice and and and, and sort of navigating those choppy waters which are coming. It's, it's really difficult. As we look forward, I guess, in terms of IDP, you must have a lot on your plate at the moment. And probably one of the bigger things that, that you're dealing with at the moment is starting planning for AIC. Is that fair to say? Definitely fair to say, Dirk. There's a lot of AIC takes a village <laughs> literally <laughs> to plan. And Again, I've only been in the in the events uh, team for the last four months, but it's great to see we've got a great team. It's great to see the work we're doing. I mean, we all know Josephine Williams had mm-hmm. been um, managing managing the event for over a decade, um, and she's moved over to a, another another division within IDP. So it's great to still have her wise counsel to rely on, given the enormity of AIEC. But you know, planning is well underway already. The planning, the pl- the program working group met in late January. So we've got the theme and the agenda set. So, you know, everyone needs to really mark their calendars. The because will be in Melbourne this year, October 22nd to 25th. And we're expecting a record breaking year. Last year was a record breaking year for in-person attendance. We had over 1,700 in-person attendees. I think we're safe to say Melbourne we will we will break the attendance record, which is great to see AIEC move from strength to strength. So I mean, I know that you know, in terms of we, we might not attract as many delegates as Taylor Swift did to the MCG <laughs> last week, but I, I think we can still pull in a record crowd. Oh, Taylor. <laughs> it's amazing to see that. how media has just been frothing over that. Like every time you open a paper or something like that website, it's just all Taylor Swift. I actually feel a little bit sorry for it. Can you can you imagine what life must be like? You know, so she's in she's in Sydney right now, and now it, it the, the it's all the rumor mill about where is she staying? Is she staying in Crown Towers? Where did she eat last night? Was that her airplane? So apparently, her private airplane left again, and they think that it's gone to Honolulu because someone tracks that stuff, but it's picking up her boyfriend, try that that football player Travis, and perhaps bringing yeah bringing him to to Sydney this week. So it's yes, the 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 bromance is going to be. All over the uh, all over the news, no doubt. If if, if he comes to town, so it'll, the media circus continues. Breaking news: Global Horizons has attracted an exclusive interview with Taylor Swift. We'll actually <laughs> be on the podcast next week, so make sure you tune in. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So, so but besides Taylor, I mean, like we've got, yeah, we do have AIEC to look forward to in a couple months, and I think the the next the next sort of cab off the rank for AIEC is we've got the call for proposals, which is opening up on the twenty first of March. So we will be hosting a information webinar on how to submit a successful. Uh, proposal on the 27th of March. So that information will go out via email and um, and on our AIEC website. So people do need to register for that session, but it's really important for prospective speakers because you really need to put some effort into your proposal, think critically about your topic, about the type of session you seek to run, really flesh out the relevance and the takeaways for the audience. But it's not impossible to do so. And we are here to help because we do want to see a diversity of opinions and thoughts and ideas and issues raised at AIEC. We don't want it always to be an echo chamber of the knowns, uh, the notables out there who who are always invited to speak. That there are, are you know young upstarts uh, in the industry. We'd like to hear from as well as researchers and you know a diversity of opinion. So certainly that call for proposals and the and the submission sort of uh, presentation uh, that will launch is it's quite it's quite important for people to to tune in and to and to be part of it because ultimately the secret sauce is all about our speakers. Last year we had two hundred and thirty different speakers across the week. Sharing their insights and opinion and opinions on a range of issues, so it's it's critical we get we get that critical mass of uh, people interested in in talking about what they do and and making sure we're just continuously pushing you know the Australian international education landscape and our and where we sit um, in in the global education industry. It's really it's really important, and that's why AIEC is always such a you know a landmark date on people's calendars every year because it's the it's the biggest event of the year for us here. My big discovery last year. And I'm a bit ashamed to say it took me took me so many years to actually go and do it. it was was actually getting into the brain date side of things, 
yeah, I'd, I'd never never sort of been to one or organised one before, and ended up having some incredible conversations. Like really, some of the best value from the week came from those little detailed conversations. And it's just one of those extra features that's been on the program for several years. And I just kind of never been pulled into orbit. But that worked really, really well. Yeah, so brain dates will absolutely continue this year. So, you know, brain dates are those are those short, sharp groups that you can create either one on one or maybe up to five sort of people in a small in a small session to talk about, you know, an area that you're passionate about or interested in. We have a variety of different types of sessions from those brain dates to fireside chats to insight sessions to, you know, panels to lightning sessions to obviously the, you know, some of the, the head, headline plenaries. So there's there's a lot of opportunities there depending on what people really want to talk about. And we're happy to help shape into the program so that we can we can put people into the right the right type of session that makes that will make a difference or will have that will lend itself to the right audience so again that's where we're where we're, the event committee are, are really here to help and it's exciting because this year's theme is the human element and we chose it really to really focus on the importance of humans as the center of what we do i mean we know chat gpt and ai and all of that you know is gaining you know a lot of a lot of the headlines, but ultimately, this is a people industry. It's all about, you know, building better futures for students. We wouldn't have, you know, big conferences like this if people didn't want to meet together. Ultimately, people don't want to necessarily meet virtually. They want to meet in person. They want those human connections. So this is really about, you know, inviting people to engage and examine and discover and learn and connect to, you know, over over that third week of October. So that theme, the human element, will be right throughout the week. And we are looking to integrate or include the voice of the international students a lot more because ultimately that's the purpose of why we're here, is making a difference, is helping to build fut- build students' futures and ensure that Australia is a, you know, a quality peer-to-peer partner in the Asia-Pacific and on the global scale of, of helping, you know, human mobility and human employability. So it's, it's, a really, it's a really exciting space, and I'm glad that uh, we've landed on that topic for this year. Yeah, that's awesome. I was good, just going to say, one of the things that always sets AIC aside for me is the, is the social program. Can you give us any insights into how that social program might be being put together at the moment? Oh, there's uh, there. I, I can't give away all the secrets. You have to invite <laughs> me back for the next podcast. But right. yes, we we have secured the venue for the Thursday evening Thursday evening gala event. Our MC has also just been confirmed. So we will actually be announcing a few of those things shortly. But I'm under embargo from announcing them announcing them today otherwise i'll get i'll get into trouble but very exciting we've got and beyond beyond the social event on thursday we've got a a full slate of things that happen obviously there are welcome reception there are happy hours and there's a variety of of things that happen during the week which is really exciting for um, everyone to get involved with because again it's not just about what happens during the sessions of the day but also what happens you know afterwards and that human connection and people Mm. getting together and really and the network that occurs. Yeah, it's one of the prompts that I always think, and it takes something like an AIC to bring it to the surface, but it's about just how many good people work in our industry. You know, you can work, you can find other industries where you kind of just go, hmm, you know, this is, you know, it might be more about the money or it might be all about, you know, the hard business lines. But when you do end up having a drink with someone that you haven't met before or, or a group of people, you just end up moving between these these people and going, you know what, there's some bloody good people that work in this industry and nice people, Absolutely. good people who, who, as, who, as you say, you know, have the student in the centre of their of their kind of outlook and, and that's what makes our, our industry so great. I really, I really believe that. Yeah, we're incredibly fortunate to be in an industry where, I mean, it is, it is very people-oriented, people-centered. There's not too many personalities and people get along really well because we're yeah. all driving towards a very, I think, a, a, a similar goal. So yeah, it's not just the, the thought leadership sh- sessions, but it's about, you know, that those conversations you have with people that perhaps you haven't seen all year or you've only interacted with uh, online or um, seen on, on various webinars. So it's a really great chance for, for people to reconnect um, and ground ourselves and look forward to the next year and making sure we're on the same page of the headline issues and, uh, and what, what's really important to the, to the sector. Absolutely. Maybe we can talk very quickly about those storm clouds that Dirk referred to a little bit earlier, this big issue that's just sort of sprung up in the last couple of weeks around visa rejections. Oh, not even, not even visa rejections, sorry, COEs being withdrawn because of the go slow on visa 
processing. And Dirk and I have talked about that earlier in the podcast. But obviously, IDP is fairly uniquely positioned to to sort of have a, a different line of sight on this. What, what are you folks seeing and what's the sort of initial reaction that IDP is having to this news? Well, I, look, I know that there's a lot of frustration in the sector right now, and I echo, you know, the concerns that have been expressed by, you know, industry colleagues, you know, in, in various th- thought pieces in newspapers and, and online. Look, a lot of hard work goes into marketing and messaging by future student offices. A lot of hard work goes into helping students apply by education counselors. A lot of hard work goes into processing the applications by the admissions teams. And all for it to be undone due to student visa uncertainties is you get to all that work and you get to that point. And it's really frustrating the sector, obviously higher education, vocational, English language colleges, whatnot. I, mean, like, I reckon we're going to see quite a few institutions move from assessment level one to two, and perhaps a few more added from uh, to AL3 as well. So buckle up. The next, the next few months, the, the, we're, we're only going to experience, I think, more frustration. I mean, certainly if I, I, I've got another call with our destination managers tomorrow. At the moment, it's a bit of a patchwork quilt. It's not universal in terms of every every institution experiencing, you know, visa rejections or visa. But everyone's experienced some level of visa slowdown and uncertainty. And the number of institutions that are withdrawing COEs or that are more uh, carefully looking at of what their risk factors are in specific markets, that is absolutely increasing um, day by day. So at the moment, it's still very much patchwork quilt. And I, I don't think we're going to see, I think, in its totality until, you know, really semester one sort of washes through and we've got to a point where it's too late for students to enroll after the start date. We're, we're, we're getting close to that point. But certainly at when we get to the point of, of census date and the government rebase the assessment levels, that will be very, very telling. With all that said, I mean, certainly there's a lot of, so there's a lot of frustration in, in the industry right now. And there's certainly a number of policy proposals which the government are considering or taking up over the next few months, uh, which really are bureaucratic nonsense and will not really tackle all the issues head on. But if I can just provide an unpopular opinion. I know that the audience for this, the audience for this podcast, you know, the listening audience are quite simpatico in terms of, you know, their frustrations and their concerns about what's happening in the unfairness and the opaque n- nature and the lack of transparency and all of that in terms of those issues swirling around. But let me just step back and play devil's advocate just for a moment. Look, through the Nixon review, the migration strategy and various position papers that the government, you know, the government released last year, I think quite clearly they telegraphed their intent that they will bring net overseas migration down to a more sustainable level within the next two years or even 18 months. So none of this should come as a surprise that, you know, the government are moving us out of uh, the passing lane uh, on the migration freeway, shifting gears down and pumping the brakes. So let's not lose sight of the fact that the federal government, there's a, the federal government, or that there will be a federal election looming, what, sometime in the next 12 to 15 months? If, if, if the government, the hard, the hard and honest truth is that if the government does not manage migration levels down quickly enough, mark my words, the opposition will run on a platform of out of control border situation with skilled migration, international students, housing affordability, and inflation all mixed into a really potent cocktail. Sprinkle on a few untimely and overhyped boat arrivals, and the government will be absolutely on the defense. So, you know, whilst the lack of clarity on visas is incredibly frustrating, and while some policy proposals really need more work, we don't want a populist tide turning dead set against the sector and losing whatever sort of, I guess, any credit, not credibility, because we have credibility, but that so, lack social of cachet. social license, yeah. the social cachet, the social license. You know, ultimately, there are no votes in international education, and that's just a hard fact. That is not to diminish the frustration we have, and certainly we do need to push back on the government on terms of where there are policy proposals that don't make sense, if they're bureaucratic nonsense. Ultimately, I I, I think most people in the sector would be fine if 
the government were very clear about the evidentiary levels and requirements if they were going to raise it for assessment level three source markets or assessment level two or three um, uh, providers that, right, the, the bar is now higher and this is what you need to show and demonstrate. I think most people would actually be all right with that because we would know what the guardrails were. At the moment, we are bumping against these guardrails and we, and we can't understand what we're doing wrong because we are working under the confines of the GTE or genuine student entry requirements, which we've been, which we have been mandated. And now it's unclear about how to move forward if all that hard work from marketing and recruitment and admissions and processing is all for naught. We've got an issue leading not just for semester one, but really leading into semester two as more institutions move down that assessment level, sort of they'll up that assessment level risk uh, category. No, mate, you bang on. Every the, the key word that keeps coming up in conversations that I'm having with people is transparency, which is exactly what you're, what, what you're discussing. It's transparency for each stakeholder within the system, be that a student, be that an agent, be that an institution at the moment. As you said, the opaqueness around that is, is, really, is really difficult for people to understand. It's difficult to navigate and it's difficult particularly from a student point of view, whether they're, how long they're going to get a visa assessment done and, and what that visa assessment may, do, may be based against the current metrics. And that, that's the hard bit without that transparency. And it's also what our brands, it's also what our Australian brands built on. Yeah, it's always been about transparency. So to not have that in the system makes it makes it difficult. But look, you know, never before have we seen so many destination countries tighten their tighten their policies from Canada to UK to Australia. It's at the moment it's whack a mole on the policy front to keep up with it all. We recently surveyed about twenty six, maybe twenty seven hundred students prospective international students intending to study abroad. And we just got the, the results back in the last sort of a week or so. And it was focused on policy awareness across these three Commonwealth destinations. And if students' propensity to change destination based on certain policy measures, whether, you know, Canada limiting uh, enrollment in certain private colleges or capping things, you know, the UK limiting dependence, uh, dependent visas to Australia in terms of, you know, various, you know, financial or English language or other sort of policy changes, uh, and what impact that it has. So to Neil O'Shaughnessy, our, our, our CEO, the IDP CEO, will be speaking on a few of these points at the Universities Australia conference next week. She's having a, a breakfast conversation or breakfast briefing with the new incoming CEO of Universities Australia, Luke Sheehy. And she's going to be bringing up some of these insights and we'll release them over the next sort of week to fortnight, because I think that it's important that given that we've got that global scale and the global, the ability to look globally across Canada, UK, US and Australia, which is quite unique, that we've got very timely, timely information, hence why we call it a pulse survey. I think the next pulse survey we'll do is probably going to be leading up towards the US election or once the presumptive nominees have been chosen, if it's Donald Trump, and if student sentiment towards the US will change, and if Australia's star will somewhat rise if the US is falling. I can't, I can't predict, but anyway, so we're going to try to keep our finger on the pulse as much as possible over the next few months because the landscape is, is shifting. There are storm clouds ahead, but it's not just an Australian issue. It's Canada, UK, there's a number of market destination places out there that are all have their own unique issues. So it's a it's a fascinating time to be in our sector. It is indeed. Yeah, you know, IDP, you know, obviously we're a, a large global player, but we, you know, we want to be part of the solution. We are also trying to advocate on behalf of the sector for, you know, broader interests to ensure that, you know, positive policy proposals don't uh, that, that policy proposals become pol uh, become positive legislation but you know have a positive intent so you know we're certainly our ears are absolutely wide open in regards to the needs of the sector and we are actively listening and actively engaging obviously with university Australia, IEAA and various sectoral bodies but if if there's uh, further work that the education industry would like to see happen, please engage with us, engage with the IDP, because we do want to ensure that Australia is not perceived to be closing the door for international students, that if the government are trying to shift downwards. That's a very generous offer. And I, I think it's really important because if if we didn't have big, you know, the biggest players in the industry like IDP getting getting behind the industry and trying to find a solution, then this basically goes goes along unchecked. So that's incredibly valuable for the entire industry and I think greatly appreciated. Alec, it's been amazing having you on the podcast. Thank you for taking the time to join us. I'm sure we'll see you throughout the year as 
AIEC marches ever closer. And Dirk, always great to chat. Thank you for the news. And for those of you listening at home, thekoalanews.com is your source of information for all your local Australian international education and some global international education news too, thekoalanews.com. Thank you both very much and look forward to catching you a little bit later in the year. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Dirk. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Alec. See you next time. The Global Horizons podcast is brought to you by The Global Society, Australia's learning abroad support company. For about 10 years, The Global Society has been supporting Australian learning abroad teams with technology, training, consulting, strategy, marketing, you name it. We all know that learning abroad is time consuming and complex. So if your team could use a little bit of extra support, reach out to The Global Society, globalsociety.com. Today's episode was recorded on Garigal land in Sydney and we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Thank you. See you next time.